Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast, do me a favor and take a minute, leave us a five-star rating and review. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, if you're interested in multifamily and you want to review a sample deal, you're in luck. We have a sample deal package to help you learn more about real estate investing and the way multifamily is put together. Just go to kasmancapital.com slash sample deal, and you'll also join our mailing list to get tips and exclusive investment opportunities if you qualify. Again, that's kasmancapital.com slash sample deal. Now, today we're going to be talking to Dwayne Clark, a.k.a. the Mailbox Money Guy. Now, he is a real estate investor, syndicator, and broker specializing in single-tenant net lease properties nationwide. Dwayne has completed over $150 million in transactions since 2012. Dwayne is also the author of three real estate investing books and the host of the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing podcast. Let's welcome to the show, Dwayne Clark. I really appreciate it, Brother John, uh, for having me on the show and look forward to having a candid conversation with you. Absolutely, Dwayne. So look, we call you the mailbox money guy. Why exactly is that? Really because I specialize and focus on single tenant net lease investments. And uh, many people kind of heard that term before, but as far as like actually what that is, it's a uh, lease agreement with one single tenant where they occupy a freestanding building and they take care of all of the expenses associated with the property. So for a few years, I've been heavily focusing on that. It's a really passive investment and investors really enjoy it. All right. So single tenant, one uh, tenant occupies, give me an example. Like what kind of, what kind of tenants are occupying these types of buildings? So these are the places that we eat, drink, get um, shop at every single day that, you know, we probably had no idea. So for example, like Walgreens pharmacy, we go there and get our, our prescriptions filled. We go get, you know, bread and, and milk and juice. These tenants actually rent and, you know, owners, individual investors actually buy and own these properties nationwide. So it's, it's very interesting because when I find out about it, my client who had owned multifamily had owned a Walgreens. And I, and I said, you own a, a Walgreens farm? I said, like, how does that even happen? So he kind of got me into that mode and kind of, and I learned from him and understood that this is actually a, a good, really good investment. So how does that work? I mean, because most people I think who are listening to this, who aren't really familiar or that familiar with the way commercial real estate works, you would assume that Walgreens, all these big companies, they buy and own the real estate in the properties where their stores are located. Uh, so explain a little bit more about how this actually works. Yeah, because uh, for these big, large companies that own, uh, that have thousands of locations nationwide and even internationally, it just wouldn't make sense for them to own every single location. So it's, it's better for them to operate leasing these types of properties. So for the benefit of the investor, they're able to be, become the landlord of these properties. And for that, not only do they rent the space, but they take care of all the expenses. So they're paying all the taxes, they're paying all the insurance, maintenance, upkeep, and everything. And that's why we call it mailbox money because they take care of everything as a really laid back investment and you get the rent check each month. That's amazing. So with these with these uh, companies really occupying these spaces, you mentioned places where we eat, places, places where we shop. Uh, and we mentioned Walgreens as an example with these single tenant lease. What's, I mean, what kind of lease structure are we talking about? Cause these people aren't going year to year, right? I mean, you're not going to lease a Walgreens space for one year. So what does that lease structure look like and how long are they actually staying in these places? Yeah. Many different uh, types of tenants are different types of lease structure. For the most part, they're on very long-term leases. So we had mentioned our example for Walgreens. Typically they'll give you a 25 year lease. So they'll be in that building renting from you, rent guaranteed for 25 straight years. CVS is another example. 7-Eleven where you go get your gas station, normally they have 15 year leases with actual um, option agreements where they'll have four, five year renewal options. So it'll be an additional 20 years on top of that. So I've sold deals where 
Um, 7-Eleven's been in the, the building for 40 something years and they just don't plan on leaving. They're doing very well. And those are some really long-term types of uh, uh, agreements that you have with these tenants, which is pretty good. So we obviously talk a lot about multifamily on this show and talk to multifamily investors and the way, you know, the deals are structured and the leases are structured and things like that. So with this, with a single tenant, you know, there seems like there's a lot of upside. So, so far you said, uh, you know, the tenant is paying for taxes, insurance, all utilities, pretty much paying for everything. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, they have different types of lease agreement, like double net and um, we're, there's some type of responsibility for the landlord, but for the most part, mailbox money, we're dealing with, and they call it absolute triple net, where the tenant is absolutely responsible for all of the stuff. And it's really just kind of a, a laid back type of agreement with that tenant. So for an investor standpoint, there sounds like there's a lot of upside. If the tenant's going to pay for everything and they're signing these long-term leases, and we're talking 10, 15, 20, 30 year leases, if they're signing leases this long, where you pretty much know what you can expect uh, as far as cash flow, and you don't have to do anything, there has to be some downside, right? Or other, otherwise, everyone would just run to these spaces, and we'd all invest in Walgreens and CVS or whatever, and uh, you know we, we'd make money hand over fist forever, and we'd all be happy. So, what are some of the downsides with the single tenant uh, leasing approach? Yeah, I mean, these investments are not for everybody. You know, you have a 25 year lease, you know what the rent is going to be. Some of them have incremental rental increases built into the lease, but it's not like an apartment investment where you can be able to force appreciation, where you can see where the market is and just have higher rents and be able to get higher returns. So this is very like, very conservative return for one. Two, you only deal with one tenant compared to, you know, a multifamily where you have 100 tenants, where if two leave, you'll be okay. You'll be able to maintain a building. If one of your tenants leave in the triple net lease um, type of property, you're, you know, you're kind of out. But the good thing about them is they have very strong guarantees. So if, if for whatever reason they do leave, they have to kind of make good on that lease and continue to pay on it. But you have some cases where some companies go belly up. Like, you know, you had um, Sears and um, Toys R Us. Davis Bridal and Toys R Us. A lot of these big name publicly traded companies, multi-billion dollar companies that just went belly up and then kind of lose out your investment. So those are the kind of the downsides. So for to kind of to mitigate the risk, of course, like with all real estate, you have to pick a, a really good location. All of the metrics have to good um, look good. A lot of the stuff that you cover on target market inside as far as like the different markets and the the intrinsical values, is there good traffic counts? Is there good population growth? Is there other jobs in the area? Uh, what's the household income? So if you kind of get those parameters, you can kind of lessen the risk that a tenant can go belly up and that tenant can be successful in that location. So, but of course, like I said, with any type of real estate, there's always risk, but I always like to look at it from intrinsical value and make sure that all of the elements look good. You have a good tenant, and also one of the, the main factors is you get a tenant that is not um, subject to e-commerce threats. Like Amazon, I buy almost everything off Amazon. So there's a lot of stores that I used to go to that I don't go to. So you want to make sure you get out of stuff that are not competing directly with it, like clothing and, and you know, kind of like, you know, furniture, different type of stuff that you can just click a button and they can deliver right to you. So you stick into locations like uh, certain types of retail, entertainment fast food, casual dining, those types of places that people are constantly going at a constant basis. If you get those elements, you have a better chance of the, the deal doing very well. So as far as trying to protect yourself, think of places where people are not going to be susceptible to e-commerce threats. So you mentioned shopping, uh, places where maybe a hair salon or things like that, where you really still physically have to go to that location as opposed exactly. to just ordering something online. So that makes sense. And you started to talk a little about uh, the location. What are some of the parameters you look for? If you could just give us a little bit more context, what parameters, what kind of markets are there states that you would, would not do business in, or you would uh, particularly look for, um, and then talk a little bit more about, again, what some of those uh, specific either red flags are or specific parameters that you do look for, for these deals. Yeah, specifically, we look for these types of tenants and these types of investments. It's probably by the tenant by tenant basis. So for example, we're doing a lot of dollar general transactions. Their business model is usually in rural type of markets. 
So they'll go into maybe like a farm town where they're the only shop in town. <clears throat> there may be a post office and a gas station, and most of the business is going to be coming there. And for those particular situations, it may work out because of like a lower, you know, populated area. But other places like McDonald's or 7-Eleven or Taco Bell, you want to go to places where a lot of people, a lot of traffic, a lot of things that's going on so they can constantly be able to get business and, and not be able to, you know, not be able to make their rent payment. So so it, it, it differs there compared to how multifamily we're looking at strong markets with large MSAs. And, you know, we try to match up to see what type of tenant base is going to be fitting with your apartment investment. This is a little bit different. You're looking more for retail settings. So please places where people are just constantly going again, like places that, you know, maybe in a mall area, there's a lot of traffic. There's close to the highway. There's good visibility. So if you get those types of things, those are the stuff you kind of look for. Uh, places to avoid, of course, is Again, it, it all depends on the tenant. If it's just a, a completely abandoned, low income, uh, low populated area, and then you want to kind of see if that would make sense for it. But for the most part, if you keep in those parameters of just a generally good market for that specific tenant, it'll work out for you. Excellent. Makes a lot of sense there. So thinking about the market, if you're relying on foot traffic like a McDonald's, you want to be in a high foot traffic location. That, that kind of makes sense. Um, interesting thinking about the rural approach where there you kind of want to be almost the only shop in town, right? Or one of the few options in town to make sure you're seeing the traffic there. Um, you mentioned earlier that while there's a lot of upside here because you do have the long link, the long leases, you have one tenant who's going to cover pretty much all of the costs. Um, there, it's more of a conservative investment. Talk about what kind of return expectations might one see in the single tenant space uh, and compare that to multifamily investing. Yeah. So, I mean, they're ranging, I say cap rates from the low end to 4% all the way to maybe 6.75%. So it's very conservative. And that's, uh, and then on top of that, adding on a mortgage, it's, so like I said, again, you're dealing with a very type of conservative investment. So it's not an investment for everybody. A lot of my older clients that are heading in retirement or people who are not really interested in real estate whatsoever, this is a good type of tenant or a good alternative to the stock market. These matches very um, well with the different types of um, investments that people are trading on the market. And then you can be into a physical real estate asset. So it's good for those types of people. Um, but it really comes down to, you know, it's ranging from four to, I would say at the highest at 7%. And it depends on the tenant, it depends on how many le how much um, term is left on the lease. Depends on the location, not, you know, not a huge number, but there's a little bit of bumps in there and depends on the, the strength of the tenant. You have corporate institutional grade and you have franchise level and those can range in different cap ranges as well. So you just kind of got to look at the overall picture and then see where that number falls at. Explain the corporate franchise or institutional level. Yeah. So for a corporate, for example, um, it's like maybe a Ruby Tuesdays where they're not publicly traded, but they're owned maybe by a, a large private equity company that may have four or 500 units under management and kind of like a large umbrella where they're kind of, um, you know, have a financial grant guarantee there. Institutional level, you have like the really large blue chip type of companies, 7-Eleven, McDonald's, which are traded publicly on the, you know, the stock exchange and have multi-billion dollars in and, and financial and revenue and things like that. Then you have a franchise level, which is maybe just a single owner that had made own 30 individual franchises that, you know, not just like a mom and pop, but they own maybe 30, 40 units. And it's like a smaller type of guarantee where they may financially back it by themselves in their own personal bank book. Uh, so those are the kind of the three levels there. Got it. And you basically weigh the credit worthiness based on how, how much backing they have. So obviously the bigger they are as an organization, the more capital they have, the easier it is to be, to work with them and kind of trust that that lease is going to be exactly. taken care of. Got it. But then Got you it. have some cases where if people want maybe a more um, better return, maybe close to a seven cap, you may go with a franchise level that have a little bit lower guarantee, a um, little bit higher risk, but so it really blends on to, the type of investment, the type of risk level, that tolerance that you're looking for. Because um, I, I have many clients that will just, they will pay a four cat for a McDonald's 20 year lease because they know it's an S&P triple B tenant 
and the, the rent is fully guaranteed, whatever is going to happen to that, um, to that property. All right. So you threw out a couple of acronyms and I'm going to need you to break them down. Uh, I know most of them, but S and P. So, uh, you yeah, said- the stand, yeah, the standards and pours, uh, which is one of like the largest national credit bureaus, you know, kind of like the, yep. the, the individual, you know, credit monitoring system that we have for a personal level. Then you have Moody's, which is another one, but S and P is usually the main one that we look at as far as kind of checking the credit worthiness for that specific tenant there. And you say triple B. Yeah, it's triple B. Bit, yeah. yeah. So they have like so many different times. They have like A minus to mm-hmm. all the way down to this. But most of the stuff are ranging and they just have so many different numbers that they calculate the financial strength of that specific tenant. Um, 7-Eleven is a credit rating of an A minus. So, you know, because like they just really one of the top tenants in the industry, you know, McDonald's is up there, um, you know, all the different types of tenants, uh, you know, Bank of America. Uh, Chase Bank, Wells Fargo, those are all in the A's. Walmart, um, Best Buy, Hobby Lobby, those have different credit ratings. So it's really just a whole bunch of different types of tenants. And usually when I'm talking to different clients and investors, I just kind of find out what their risk tolerance and we kind of go over the different tenants and their, you know, their credit profiles and see which one is a good fit for them that they feel comfortable with. Yep. And Triple B is uh, the Better Business Bureau. And then uh, going back earlier, you said we talked about triple net and double net leases. Can you just explain the difference between double net and triple net? Yeah. So uh, the double net where there is some type of landlord responsibility. So in that particular scenario, the, the tenant is responsible for the taxes, insurance, and the landlord is responsible for the roof and the structure. So those cases, there's going to be some type of handholding kind of involvement with the tenant. And with an absolute triple net, the tenant pays for all of the bills. So insurance, taxes, maintenance, upkeep, and even paying the taxes directly to the town. And then you just make sure you, you get your um, rent check each month um, after all the expenses are paid. But those are the, the main structures there. Most of the times it's dealing with either roof or structure or some type of thing of, or a combination thereof. Um, but for the most part, it's still a little bit more or less hands-on than, say, a multifamily investment where you're kind of managing the manager and doing types of, you know, at value add type of projects. And this doesn't really involve that type of stuff. So with this, I, I know some folks who invest in that space. Um, but what about syndication? Are you seeing people kind of syndicate these triple net deals or these single tenant deals where they actually pull resources together from different investors? So let's just assume it was a $10 million deal where they would actually bring the capital together for that and buy it? Or you see this primarily as one investor or one group, one family office going in and buying these individual properties themselves? I'm seeing both um, for the most part, because like I said, it's not really high, high return type of investment like apartments. So you're not going to see like a plethora of type of syndications in this space. Um, but we're seeing them structured in um, DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trust, and TICs. So um, we're in that case where they have the that individual sponsor buy the buy the investment, um, have everything all set up, and then they bring in investors to co-own that space. Um, so again, it really depends on the type of return you're getting from it. But you know, a lot of people are still buying those in syndications and getting a good return because for that particular investor, they just really want a really conservative, hands-off approach. And I had you know a number of clients where we you know brought into deals where. They just wanted to have nothing to deal with um, going through the whole process of buying a property, doing an offer, getting an attorney, um, engaging with a title company, doing the due diligence, doing the closing, and then sending the transfer papers to the tenant. They just don't want to do anything. They just want to write a check, know it's a, a Walgreens where it's a institutional grade tenant and get their check and they'd be able to live their lives. So, so again, there's different types of investment for different types of folks. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of people doing syndications and there are a lot of people doing, you know, buying directly as well. There you go. Well, sounds like an interesting opportunity there. Uh, let's go back to the downside, right? So we've talked about the different levels and qualities of uh, ratings. What happens if that tenant does leave? Um, how does the owner at that point get it ready for the next tenant? How do you get it leased up? What's that process and how long does it take to go from having a, a tenant such as, McDonald's or Toys R Us or Chase Bank to get a new tenant in there and get them ready? Yeah, for the most part, we hope that we that you follow the steps of getting a good piece of real estate to start from. 
So if you get like a Chase Bank and they're not doing well and they decide to leave, if that location is, you know, good traffic is a hard corner location, it has all the intrinsic values, you should be able to find a suitable tenant replacement. Uh, we had a case where a tenant um, moved out of a, a 7-Eleven, which is pretty rare, but then Taco Bell moved in to that location because it just fit that particular location for them. Um, but so it really comes down to, you know, if you're buying at a good price per square foot, as far as like the rent, and you'd be able to kind of replace that with a different tenant, but it really comes down to the real estate. Uh, just like we buy for multifamily and other different types of assets. If you get a good market, good location, all the, the elements look good, you should have a better chance of filling that tenant. As far as timeline, it you know it can range. Um, but um, to kind of answer your question before, as far as kind of like if they leave, a lot of these tenants, and depending on which one you go with, corporate, institutional, or franchise, they have like a guarantee for that lease. So if they end up prematurely leaving on the lease for whatever reason, they will still have to owe the balance of that rent there. And then once they kind of complete that or maybe do like a negotiation of a payoff, then you can be able to kind of, you know, look for the next tenant opportunity to, to move into that, to that space. But um, as far as me seeing in the marketplace and seeing how things going on, we haven't seen much problems if you choose a really good location that makes sense that will fit the profile of other different tenants down the line. So we don't look at a deal saying it looks good today, but if this tenant happens to move out, could we replace it with a similar or another competing tenant that can do well in that space as well? And who pays for like uh, the, the outfitting of getting, going from one tenant to the next tenant? I mean, is that something where the new tenant pays for it or do you as kind of that property owner, are you kind of responsible for some of that as well? For the most part is on the tenant. Um, so it depends on the structure of the lease, what you're doing. We had cases where I'm, I work with a lot of new development where the developer does the build out, the, the tenant signs the, the, the new lease, and then they start that relationship there or the, the owner owns the land and the tenant comes and builds all the improvements and they do everything themselves and sign the long-term lease. So really, it's, it really depends on this situation. Um, but we've seen both, um, like I said, I deal with a lot of new development. Uh, so it really depends on that sp specific tenant, tenant as well, because some of them more, are more um, signed leases where the tenant um, has the developer does all, does all improvements. And then we have cases where they do all improvements themselves. So it really comes down to the situation at that point. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that and clarifying it. So you've written three books, Dwayne. You are the host of the Wealthy Real Estate Investing Podcast. What sparked you to write the books as well as launch the podcast? Uh, it's really just to give more value. I've been getting a lot of questions on specific things. So I just wanted to kind of have a resource where if I get those, I can say, here you go. Here it kind of answers most of your questions. Um, and just to kind of give more value to my existing investors and, you know, potential investors that's out there that may have questions that want to get into um, single tenant net lease or multifamily or investing with their IRA. So I just kind of wrote those as kind of resources to kind of give back and, you know, the more knowledge, they'll be able to make more informed decisions. And then they may decide that they would like to work with me on that capacity to help them to take them on that journey. So it's really just kind of giving back to, to help out more people to get informed. What's something you wish people knew about single net investing? Um, I would think, like I said, there's not a lot of awareness as other asset classes like multifamily, the birth strategy, fix and flip. I mean, there's not like TV shows about owning a, a Walgreens. I mean, it's not like the sexiest thing in the world to own a Taco Bell. Um, so I wish there were probably more resources out there because when I got um, involved in the space, I learned from my mentor, um, but to kind of learn the mechanics and, and went out to try to buy any books or resources, there weren't any. So that's why another motivation I wrote the book because there wasn't um, many resources. Um, but you kind of got to learn about it because it's not just the real estate side of buying an actual piece of real estate, but the individual tenants you know, what tenants to look out for, you know, what is the corporate or franchise guarantee? What is all these different types of things and what markets to look for? So all those little nuances that, that are involved in making an informed decision to buy these types of investments, I wish was more out there. So that's my goal is to kind of bring that in the forefront, do podcasts like this to kind of let listeners know that this is a type of investment that's available. 
Um, you could buy those. You could actually own a McDonald's, a Walgreens, CVS, Dollar General. Um, it's you know the the places that we interact with on a daily basis to go you know pick up our to pick up our prescription. We never knew that. So I would like to kind of just let the masses know and and let you know that you can buy it and you can be you know a really passive investor if you wanted to. I love it. I mean, I think the thing is, uh, you know, for folks who maybe are more familiar with business or stocks or just understanding kind of the way those businesses operate, because you've talked about the ratings, the Moody's, the S&P's and, you know, understanding kind of how these the credit worthiness of some of these companies. If you understand that aspect and you're willing to accept a lower return on your investment, um, there's not a whole lot of back and forth. And once you decide to buy a Walgreens, you bought a Walgreens and you're in at least for 20, 30 years or whatever that time frame is. So it's not like you have to be uh, the, the greatest property manager or the greatest asset manager or anything like that. You really have to make sure you're making smart decisions up front. And if you're willing to accept a smaller return, this could be an interesting avenue or an interesting pathway for you to invest, um, especially if you have a long ways to go. I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, investing passively and investing with maybe more retirement funds or money that you're not really looking to tap into right away might be a great avenue if you are thinking about kind of going out of the single tenant space. Or even to add to that, um, diversifying. Um, a lot of my clients, they own apartments, they own office, they own different types of stuff through syndication and own it directly themselves. So this could be just another element on your portfolio to diversify where you're not just all your eggs in just in one basket. So that's a kind of a good you know, way to look at it as well. Awesome. I love it. I love it. All right, Dwayne, we are going to transition to our bullseye round. You ready? Absolutely. How has a failure or parent failure set you up for success later? Well, uh, I always encourage failure because I end up learning new things. So in my life, when starting out from flipping houses to property management, when things don't go well, I end up studying other different avenues, speak with other people, network with other people, and I end up you know, being successful in the next run. What is the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year? Uh, Winning Through Intimidation by Robert Ringer, as well as uh, Million Dollar Habits by the same author, Robert Ringer. And they're really just focusing on kind of like your last question of when going through failure, how to be able to kind of push through and not be able to knock it down and just kind of winning through any type of intimidation and having to go through success. So the intimidation is internal intimidation, not necessarily intimidating other people. Exactly. Okay. I was like, man, that sounds like <laughs> a very, very cutthroat book there. Uh, <laughs> should not hang them over the balcony. Yeah, right. All right. All right. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Uh, Asana.com uh, as well as uh, Zoho CRM. I, I use those things daily. It's uh, always on my screen. Um, I can't live without it. My assistant, they, everything operates through there and just organizes my day as well as all my contacts who I got to follow with every single day as well as all the different projects that we're working on, multiple projects and everything can be done in one council as well as on mobile. What is the daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Uh, I have to make sure that I have to wake up. Um, I usually wake up at between 4 and 4.15 a.m. I got two young kids, so I got to make sure I get the the, um, the town running and I make sure that I have to eat because sometimes I get really excited that I'm like working on some new project or some new deal and I end up heading into the, uh, the basement office and I start working and I forget to eat. So that's one of the things that I've been really structured on is I wake up really early, eat, read, and then do my little workout. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew 12 months ago? Uh, networking on a high level, um, going to different networking events outside of my state, um, podcasting, which has been huge. It's like a really big networking tool and also to outreach to, uh, to the masses to kind of you know, share your message and to, to share helpful knowledge with others. What advice would you give to a smart, driven college student about the real world? Uh, you have to adjust. Um, and one big advice, which I have a couple young guys who I mentor, is that you have to uh, ascribe to Automobile University. Um, sometimes I'm in my car and I, people tend to just put on music. I just say, hey, go get an audiobook, go get some podcasts, and just kind of just continue the constant learning. Uh, always start reading, uh, always engage with people that are smarter than, smarter than you in the room. Don't be afraid to ask questions. 
Uh, so that's the thing I kind of constantly tell my young guys to, to constantly do to, you know, hopefully be a very successful individual. What advice should they ignore? Uh, the negative. Um, so there's a lot of negative people out there that say you can't do this, uh, you can't do that. Um, especially if you're in a specific culture, they say then you, you, you can't be smart, you can't be a, a millionaire, you can't be a billionaire. Um, ascribe that you can always actually do it. Um, I always say that if this person, why can't I do it? So if you have that mentality that you can push through, and it, especially here in America, you can do anything you want. So. If you just subscribe that you can be successful, anything can happen for you. Yeah, just to build on that, I mean, one thing that I try to tell people is ask yourself, how can I, right? So maybe you can't right now, maybe you don't have the resources, maybe you're not in a position to do it. Ask yourself, how can I? And then the, the, the mind just opens up, possibilities start to present themselves to you. So if you ask yourself, how can I? That's gonna be a, a much more powerful way of thinking about uh, moving yourself forward to any goal that you have or anything that you see in the world. And you may realize that, hey, you know what? How can I? It's gonna be a lot and maybe I'm not willing to invest that, but that's okay. And then you figure out what your true goals are based on that, so. Exactly, absolutely. Dwayne, what are you curious about right now? Uh, I'm say I'm curious to just learn more. Um, uh, my mind is just open. It's been open for a while. Um, the more and more I talk to more people and then find out, learning more about their business and things that are that are uh, uh, available that's out there, I just become more curious. Um, even just like the little small things, like uh, me and my wife are finding out how ways to have better relationships with our kids and our family. And we want to make sure we hop on a plane and see her family. So I want to be able to just be open to things and you know not not be negative. You're just like, everything's about to be positive and having a lot of gratitude in life. I love it. All right, give me the best place to grab a bite in your neighborhood. Um, to, in West Hartford is Bar Taco. I'll say hands down the best uh, tacos in town. Uh, Fleming's Steakhouse, uh, whenever I indulge, uh, high-end steakhouse, but that's the best steak that I ever had in my entire life. Uh, so those are the top two places I would recommend if you're out here in Connecticut, West Hartford, Connecticut. All right, I love it. All right, real quickly, give me the names of the three books that you've written. Oh, Real Estate Mailbox Money, um, The Real Estate IRA, and Apartment Building Wealth, and you know, all available on Amazon. And specifically for your listeners, if anyone wants a copy of The Real Estate Mailbox Money, um, you just go to our website, buynnproperties.com for a slash target market insights, because uh, we're actually updating the um, that version um, and we're in process of doing that to a newer version. So we're giving that one out for free to anyone who's interested. Awesome. We'll definitely make sure we link to that in the show notes so our listeners can easily access that. Dwayne, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to contact you? Um, I'm through all the social media. You can just type in my name, Dwayne Clark, D-W-A-I-N-E, Clark with an E, as well as our website, buynnproperties.com. If you have any interests or have questions at all, just on mailbox money tenants or marketplaces i just love to have a conversation whoever whenever um and like i said social media anytime any place Dwayne, pleasure having you on the show love the information and walking us through uh single net tenants you know i learned a lot today talking to you and some stuff i knew and some stuff i didn't know so it's good just learning a little bit more about the different aspects and the different options out there uh, when it comes to commercial real estate investing. And again, if you're a multifamily investor, maybe this is something to consider adding into your portfolio. And if you're already in the single net space, maybe this is something where you can pivot or figure out how do you take multifamily and kind of work it all together. But it's always good to understand the options that are out there and how it kind of impacts the multifamily landscape, as well as your overall investing portfolio. Dwayne, take care, man. I know we'll be in touch soon and we look forward to staying close. Thank you, brother John. Really appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Have a great week.